I'm Camille Pagan, and this is the story behind the story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Camille Pagan. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you tuning in to each and every episode. You know that you can subscribe to the show over at HankGarner.com. There's some handy links in the right-hand sidebar uh, to help you do that so you never miss an episode. And I really hope you're enjoying the content that we're bringing you. And it's because of our wonderful sponsors that we're able to bring you the author interviews that we do each and every day. Uh, some new sponsors this month, Holly Heisey Designs. Authors, you have just a few seconds uh, when someone is browsing for your book on Amazon or one of the other bookstores to make that impression. Holly is one of the very best cover designers, and her designs will make your book stand out from the crowd. Uh, go visit her at Holly Heisey Design. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, A Bright Shore, The Eden Chronicles, Book One by S.M. Anderson. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about this book coming up. A military sci-fi political thriller set a short decade from now. And uh, you're going to love this book. Uh, this is a brand new book by a brand new author. And he's doing some really, really awesome stuff. Uh, go pick up a copy of A Bright Shore, The Eden Chronicles, Book One. And go uh, support this first time author. He's doing some really great stuff. I'm going to be telling you more about it in the next few days. Uh, also, thank you to Chuck Buddha for uh, sponsoring the show. There's some links to his work uh, in the show notes as well. And at the end of the show, as always, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Camille Pagan on the show with me. She has a brand new book out called Woman Last Seen in Her 30s, and uh, it is a fantastic book. I can't wait for all of you to pick up a copy of it. Welcome to the show, Camille. Thank you, Hank. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, it goes back pretty pretty early in my life, like a lot of the guests on your show. I remember being a small child sitting on my bed with a notebook and trying to write my own stories. Um, I think for a while you know, you, the possibilities are endless as a child. And so you think you can do it. And then you hit maybe your 20s and it <laughs> seems a little more intimidating. But I really, as long as I've been able to hold a pen or a pencil, I've wanted to write. I love that. Uh, there, there just seems to be something in storytellers that you, you're either born to it uh, or not. And I, I, I yes, do sir. think, I think it, you can teach people to to write better uh, but I don't know that, that you can teach someone to be a storyteller. I think it's either there or it's not. And those that it is, it's it always shows up really early. Yeah, it's an innate desire, really. And I think you're right. It's it's in you always. I think we can be taught to turn it down or to have self-doubt, things that maybe put it on pause for a while. But it's still there lurking. And even if you're not writing books, you're finding other ways to tell stories. I, I think it can definitely be squashed uh, or at least discouraged. Uh, and mm -hmm. and, and it, it seems like there's always so much discouragement around when, and then you hear, uh, you know, the story of someone who perseveres and, uh, you know, writes regardless of everything. Uh, it's, it's really amazing that the, the gift uh, just kind of won't be held down forever. It's, it's really an amazing thing. It is. That's why I hate that bit of advice about, oh, if you could do anything else, do that. Don't be a writer. I don't really think it's a choice. I think that if you're going to be a writer, you're going to be a writer. Um, all of the undesirable aspects of it are not enough to deter you. So I think that's just lousy advice. <laughs> well, well, it's it's lousy advice for a lot of reasons. And, and one of those is that uh, it, it seems that we, we uh, confuse uh, – 
gifting with career or and gifting is maybe you know not the right word but you know there, there's something in you that people are are kind of made to do something and and maybe that's not the thing that you make money with but it's the thing that makes you whole and it doesn't yes. necessarily have to be the thing that you support your family with and it's it's a very uh, weird confusion that we put on that. It definitely is. I couldn't have put it better myself. I think um, it's not quite a hobby. It's not a vocation. <laughs> it's really a part of your personality in a way that I guess art can be that way for anyone. My sister is a painter, and even though she works um, has this lovely job at Delta Airlines, she's never been able to stop painting and drawing. Um, and I think it just becomes a part of who you are. I think you're right. Um, were you a bookish kid? Oh, my. Oh, yes. Uh, it's funny because I have to now tell my daughter, who is almost 10, to not walk down the stairs reading a book. And I remember my own mother telling me the same thing. You know, you'll break your, your leg. <laughs> Put your book down while you're going down the stairs. I really, books are my childhood. That's what I remember more than any other aspect. And I was just telling my daughter how... Uh, my childhood best friend, who now writes novels as well, it's so interesting. Uh, her name's Jessica Brockmore, and she writes historical fiction. She and I used to go to the local library most days, and I remember getting to the point where I had read my way through everything I wanted to read at the library, and I thought, I'm going to have to go to a new library. <laughs> I was just was such a bookish kid. That's so funny. Was there any uh, particular genre or type of book that, that you loved more than others? Well, I think when I started on chapter books, I read a lot of kind of semi-fantasy books, A Wrinkle in Time and that series. I read all of the C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, and then a bunch of his other books. Um, I was raised on the Bible, so I think that kind of influenced what I liked at the time. And then as I got older, I went through the babysitter club books and read all of Judy Bloom, but really read whatever I could get my hands on. I remember looking through medical journals just because I needed something new to read. (laughs) (laughs) Mentioned C.S. Lewis, which is really funny uh, because uh, me too. I I grew up in a very religious home and uh, Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis is that, um, that kind of gateway for a lot of people because uh, evangelicals yeah. love him um, because mm-hmm. he wrote Mere Christianity and the screw tape letters and all that. And yet he wrote mm-hmm. these wonderful fantasy books with witches and magic. And, <laughs> and, and you know, it's so such interesting a, in retrospect that that was okay. I know. You I know. know. I've had this conversation so many times. I know. (laughs) You know, from all this pagan myth that, uh, and and we're okay with that. So that's, that's really. Oh, imagine my parents' horror when I married a man whose last name was Pagan or Pagan. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I I didn't even, I didn't even make that connection. That's that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, So, so what did you, uh, what did you decide to pursue when you got to college? And what did you think that you were going to do with your life? Well, it's really interesting because I got a full ride to attend the University of Michigan. And I was the first one in my family to go to college. And there was a lot of pressure to do something useful. And so I thought I would go into medicine because I really, I like reading about health. I am um, I do health journalism as my other career still. And it quickly became apparent that I was lousy at the science. I just was not of the caliber of person who (laughs) can go to medical school. What I ended up doing was just excelling in all, any class where writing was involved. Um, I became a, an English major pretty quickly and was editing my friend's papers and helping people through anything that was written. And so by about junior year, I realized, okay, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm clearly going into the literary arts, but I still, I knew that coming out of college, you know, I didn't have a trust fund or any any pile of money to rely on. And I thought I would go into journalism. So I took a postgrad course at um, Radcliffe at Harvard, which is now at the Columbia, uh, Columbia University, and learned how to become a magazine editor. And so I went to work at Fitness Magazine as my first job had a wonderful mentor there who taught me the ins and outs of editing an article. 
um, took a couple other positions after fitness. And then in 2004, I believe it was, I went out on my own and became a freelance journalist because I wanted to be the one writing the articles rather than editing them. And then it was about four more years before I started writing fiction in earnest. I've, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who began their writing careers uh, in journalism. And mm -hmm. I, I also, I always find it really interesting that uh, this kind of, uh, this path uh, that one leads to the other. Uh, do, mm -hmm. do you think that there were any particular skills that you picked up from journalism that have helped you in writing fiction? Oh, yes. I was just chatting with a friend of mine yesterday who is also a journalist and uh, an author. And just the deadline driven nature of journalism is excellent practice. You really cannot be a perfectionist. And that translates well into fiction because, oh, my goodness, you know, with a novel, you could really tinker with it for 20 years if you were allowed to. But in journalism, you learn to ship, you know, you do as well as you can and then you send it off. And um, for me, I've just been able to stay. I set deadlines for myself for any draft. I meet them. I publish a lot of books that way and just get past that worry of, oh, it's not good enough. It's never going to be good enough. You know, every story I write, I think, oh, I could have done better and then I'll do better the next time. Um, but you have to move forward. A, a lot of authors struggle with, with doubt and, uh, and, you know, the feelings of inadequacy. And I think a lot of times <clears> that manifests itself in the not wanting to finish or to mm -hmm. perpetually edit. Um, so I love that, that it's uh, you know, you get to a point where you have to ship and, and you have to, mm -hmm. you have to be okay with the story. Um, and, and knowing that, uh, you know, if you don't, you're going to be like George Lucas and, and keep going back and re remaking <laughs> star Wars and adding, you know, um. scenes to it that were not there that, because you just can't, you can't be okay with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what was the, the catalyst for writing that first uh, piece of fiction that you decided to? You know, I had always wanted to write novels and it was always sitting in the back of my, um, in the back of my mind that I would do this one day, but I was really intimidated. And I think that's true for a lot of authors. <clears throat> you look up to these literary giants and you think I can never do that, but you're not trying to do that. You know, when you actually start writing fiction, you have to find your own voice and channel that into your work. And it's not, it's influenced by, but not the same as the people that you adore. So for me, it was 2008 and I had just given birth to my daughter and one of my very dear friends who I had lived close to and traveled a lot with, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and it was very apparent right away that um, it was very serious. And then she was diagnosed as terminal. And I, I guess, I just had life's big questions on my mind. And so I sat down and I had this idea for a book about a woman whose best friend has suffered a brain injury. And I sat down one night and I still remember it was almost like being possessed. I started writing and I thought, this is amazing. I don't know why I wasn't doing this thing. And then I just kept going night after night, page after page, you know, had one chapter, then another, and very quickly wrote that first book on draft. Took a few more months to edit it, started sending it around to agents. Um, I found my agent fairly quickly, which was lovely and um, kind of a happy accident. And the rest is history. And that first book was The Art of Forgetting, uh, right? Mm-hmm. That's um, right. Yep. You, uh, you talked about that book coming out really quickly uh, and, uh, you know, that, that it was born out of this, this personal grief that you were dealing with and, and mm -hmm. wrestling with life's big questions. Uh, it writing so many times is such a catharsis, uh, for mm -hmm. channeling those emotions. And, uh, it, it's, it's really a strange thing that we make up stories about, uh, completely new people. And yet the pieces <laughs> of us and the people that, that we know and love and, and, you know, you get this whole, uh, emotional experience out of it. Uh, have, have people that have picked up that book and read it? Um, have, have they communicated with you and are, are they picking up things from that book? Uh, maybe that, that you never expected other strangers to, to get from it. Yeah, that's the beauty of writing. I really 
I heard from a lot of people from that first book, and I remember thinking, this is why I did this. You know, you're going to have bad reviews, and they, and certainly I've had my fair share of them, but you're not writing for the critics, and I think that's important. I think that as a writer, the reason why I would want to publish a book and why I do is to at least impact one person positively. And so with each book, I've had a couple of people reach out and say, you know, this really meant a lot to me or it helped me or I was going through something similar. And and that just means the world to me. I think it's so moving and incredible that we can connect now. I think it's the one upside of social media that your your readers are able to easily find you and reach out and let you know that your book meant something to them. Um, what was the... Uh... What was it like to follow up that book? Because when, when you have a debut book that is so emotional, so impactful uh, and resonates with people, uh, is, is there a fear of following that book up with something? And, and will people feel like after the other one was uh, was so meaningful, you know, will I do anything again that, that is not banal and... <laughs> and you know <laughs> do, do, do you ever you know struggle with that kind of uh fear and doubt well i have i am such a case in point of what not to do so my first book everyone says oh your first book will never be published my first book was published it was a lovely experience um and then i wrote two more books that haven't that were never published and in retrospect i can see that i was writing to the market and not by heart. I wasn't writing what I was meant to write, what moved me. And so both books were pretty lousy. And I knew the one I didn't even send it to my agent. I was just like, oh, this is, this is terrible. And then the next one, I was like, well, maybe. And I sent it to her and she's like, this is fine. I could probably sell it. But I don't think this is the book that you're supposed to put out. And so I had kind of a crisis moment of, oh, gosh, you know, is this it for my career? And then I thought, I'm just going to start writing for myself. You know, it, that's kind of how I wrote the first book. And I really needed to write something that just made me laugh and cry. And so I sat down, same thing as last time, started writing a chapter and then another and another. And that book was Life and Other Near-Death Experiences. And I sent it to my agent and I, was, I warned her. I said, this was a little different for me because it's really the funniest book I've ever written, but also the saddest. The protagonist is diagnosed with um, cancer, and the same day that she receives this diagnosis, her husband misunderstands why she's uh, so upset and informs her that he is gay. And, yeah, it's really... And so she overreacts. She's an optimist, and she goes on this journey... And I, it's just such a joy to write. I, there's no other way to explain it. I just loved writing this book so much. And it became a model for how I write my books going forward. If I'm not loving it, which I know a lot of people hate drafting, but I really enjoy it. If I'm not amused and feeling sad and feeling emotional while I'm writing, then probably working on the wrong book. Well, you know, that, that brings up a great uh, topic, is writing to market versus writing for yourself. Uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. will say, uh, you know, you need to know who your market is and you need to be hitting, uh, you know, certain points and you need to, uh, you know, use certain tropes uh, because your audience is going to expect those. And if you, you know, throw them something they're not expecting, they're going to put the book down and move on to the next thing. Um, and, and maybe some genres work better for that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm yeah. with you. I, I'm in the camp that if, if you're not feeling it when you're writing it, then when you're reading it, you're not going to feel it. Uh, so oh, absolutely. Is, is there any, anything that you've learned that helps you to do that? Um, you know, and, and do you ever worry about writing something so far left field that you're just going to alienate everybody? Not yet. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure I'll get to that. Although really, I have to tell you with, Almost every draft, my closest friend reads all of my early drafts, and she reminds me every time because I have amnesia. I have, like, literary amnesia that each time I freak out and I think people are going to hate this. Um, all of my books are protagonist-driven. You know, for me, the story starts with the protagonist, and that informs the rest of the book. It's really who the main character is, how they feel, how they view the world, and and a lot of times my protagonists are a little unlikable. They're not 
the quintessential likable, you know, great hero, they're often very flawed because I think people are, I think it's unrealistic to write books about people who are just so lovable. Um, but you know, you know, I freak some, out. Well, some days I wake <laughs> up and I'm not lovable. Some days I'm you know, a grump and, and, and probably hard to live with. And, and some days I'm pretty sure I'm everybody's hero, but I'm not all of those things every day. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's real to be a little flawed and uh, a, a little better than, than we deserve some days. And it's just life, yeah. you know? I, I totally agree. And I really am most drawn to books that are, that feel real, that show the warts and all version of humanity. And that's true across genres. I read pretty broadly. I read everything from romance to literary fiction, uh, pick up the occasional sci-fi book. I mean, I really love a lot of different kinds of books. And I find that the ones that resonate, they can be written completely differently, but they just show me a real glimpse of humanity, of what people are really like. Well, we've talked about that before, that uh, a lot of times genre is just window dressing. Uh, but what we mm-hmm. really want when we pick up a book is a good story of humanity. We, we want to know mm-hmm. um, how we see ourselves in this book, how we see the people around us. And, uh, mm-hmm. and we want to learn something about how we interact with each other. And sometimes uh, that happens on a spaceship. Sometimes that happens while battling <laughs> a dragon. And sometimes it's about a woman who has a meltdown in a grocery store. You know, it's just that's right. It, it, it just it happens <laughs> all over the place. Well, that last one sounds especially compelling to me, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could have been me yesterday. You never know. <laughs> oh, so That's great. life and other near-death experiences. Uh, you, so you, you turned it into your, uh, to your agent. And you said, this one is a little weird for me. Um, what happened with that book? Oh, she called me immediately. She called me from the Starbucks. This is my agent. And she said, I'm sitting here laughing and crying. I had no idea that, you know, you could write this way. And it's funny because my first book was a little witty. Um, It's not like that came out of nowhere. But my agent was just like, I. And it's funny because a lot of the people, the editors that we submitted it to, I think they were afraid to publish a book like that. There was a lot of, you know, I'm not sure. And Lake Union, which is an Amazon imprint, who is now my publisher, they called immediately. The editor there, Danielle Marshall, who um, is now their editorial director, she read it and called like two days later and she said, I want this. And I said to my agent, this is the person I want to publish my book. I want someone who really gets it. And they just sold it like hotcakes. I mean, they, (laughs) they did a great job with it. So... I think you really you want someone who's going to champion your work in terms of an editor and an editing team. I, I love what what the Amazon imprints are doing uh, now, uh, Lake Union and uh, Forty Seven North, and uh, a lot of their imprints are just doing really cool stuff and, mm-hmm. and taking chances on books that uh, that have paid off. Um, yeah, I, I think they're doing fantastic work. Agreed. Yeah, um, do you have some news about that book? Uh, is it uh, has has that been optioned? It was. It was optioned for film by Jessica Chastain. She has a Freckle Films and Maven uh, production, I believe it's called. Freckle Films is her production company. And yeah, they they were really excited about it. And I am triply thrilled. Nice. Oh, she's just such a smart, amazing woman. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the last you. three books have been uh, with Lake Union, including your newest one, woman last seen in her thirties. Um, I, I got a copy of this mm-hmm. book. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks ago and I usually have a stack of books on my desk. Uh, I, I have a, a desk in our living room and then I have my uh, office out where I record podcasts and stuff. And uh, a lot of times my, my family will come by and look through the, the stack of books that I've got. Mm-hmm. And uh, two of my teenage daughters uh, fought over this book. And when I was trying to get my hands on it um, so that I could read the book before talking with you, I had to keep 
hunting down which one of them had stolen the book. And uh, oh, that's they, were like, they were like, oh, dad, this is this is a great book. You're going to love it. I was like, well, I wouldn't know because I, you keep stealing the book. But, um, <laughs> tell, tell, tell your daughters I said thank you. I, I will. I will. <laughs> um, tell us about this story and where it came from and who, who is the protagonist that you chose for this one? Well, you mentioned earlier about how uh, there's a lot of thought in the industry about what will work, what are people looking for, and... I had read recently that, you know, a lot of the best selling books had 29 year old female protagonists. This is right before I started Woman Last Scene. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I'm not 20 anymore. And I just, I wanted to read a protagonist who was no longer young. I just was picking up one book after another where women were starting their lives instead of further along. Um, so I had that idea in the back of my head. And then I, had this incident in a grocery store myself where a young man had bumped into me and he really, he just kind of looked through me and didn't apologize. He went on his way and I was so angry, but then I got in my car and I thought, Oh, I just had an idea. <laughs> I would, have, would have gone back and thanked the guy if I had the chance. Um, and really started writing the next day. Like from that moment, my protagonist was born. I, I had this character, Maggie Half Moon Harris, fully formed in my head, which is a lot of times how the book ideas come to me and everything that happens to her, her husband, he leaves her and it's very unexpected. She thought that he was her one sure thing. And she has all these other anxieties. None of them are based in reality. And the thing that does happen to her that I didn't worry about. And so she digs in her heels. She tries to avoid change as people will do myself included. When, when change happens, we try to keep everything the same as much as possible. But over time, she, learns to embrace what life has thrown her way and and realizes that she can't necessarily change all of her circumstances, but she can change her reaction to them. And in doing so, finds joy and, and meaning in her life. I love it. So not only are you not writing to market uh, and, and, and doing away with all the tropes, you're actually standing back and throwing rocks at all the tropes. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> But, but, I, it's, I but it's obviously resonating with people. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I said I wouldn't frown at that description. <laughs> I, I like it. Well, it's obviously resonating with people. And, uh, you know, I I think that we, uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll gravitate toward books because they're comfortable and because we recognize uh, things that, that we maybe just finished reading in the previous book and we, we get really comfortable mm -hmm. in that space. But a lot of times you don't remember those books. Uh, then you get a book like this that, that kind of throws a monkey wrench and all that. And then that's the book that you wind up talking about and recommending to everybody. Um, so, you know, uh, congratulations on that. Uh, oh, thank are, you. I'm so glad you think so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the character of Maggie, um, did you... Was there anything that you did specifically to get in her head uh, other than your, you know, your bump in at the grocery store? Uh, did you do things to, to try to uh, commiserate with her? You know, it's interesting because Maggie is probably the most likable character I've ever written. Um, certainly that's what I'm hearing from my readers. But it took me, I don't know what this says about me as a person, it took me a little bit longer to think through what she would do in the middle of the book because she is really a worrier. And I think that that's true. You know, in my work as a journalist, I've interviewed hundreds of women at this point, um, many of them around Maggie's age range or just a little bit younger. And I think that a common theme I hear for mothers is that being a mother makes you anxious. There's just, you know, you're, have all these other humans to think about. So life's possibilities are coming at you. So it should have been a little easier for me. I'm a mother myself, but I had to think because Maggie is so kind and giving and she's such a innate caregiver that I had to think, what would she really do in this circumstance? And some of her decisions are not things I would have, like they're not decisions I would have made necessarily if I were in her shoes. So you always have to separate yourself from what would you do versus what would your character do? And that can be tricky. Um, you talked about your books being protagonist driven uh, and mm -hmm. you write in the first person. Uh, does this help to get uh, in the character's head? And um, 
you know, a lot of times when you're writing, uh, the characters come alive to you, and, and writers talk about, um, you know, having conversations with these, fi- you know, fictional people, and and uh, mm-hmm. you know, even talk about reporting on what you see happening in your head as these characters live out. Uh, but a lot of times when writing first person, it, it's even more intimate than that. Uh, is, is there anything that you do each day when you sit down to write uh, to turn Camille off? And uh, to pick up to pick up Maggie, I reread my first chapters. It's usually because those are where the character begins. They really come to life in chapter one, maybe chapter two. It you know that's the introduction to who they are, how are they thinking, where are they at when they're starting their lives in this novel, and so. It's kind of, I mean, I keep thinking there's got to be a better way to do this because it wastes time to reread your chapters over and over. But I, I generally do that as I sit down each morning to write. Do you do you wind up uh, editing a little bit of those previous chapters as you go? Sometimes, especially early on, you catch things where, you're, you know, you've been looking at your own words for so long that you miss really obvious things. Um, so I will tweak a little, but mostly I'm just trying to get in the spirit of the book. I'm trying to get into the pages and immerse myself and take myself out of it. Um, when you finish that first draft and, and you come to the end of it, what's your process mm-hmm. like for, uh, do you put the book away for a little bit and then come back and revisit it? Or uh, do, you, do you turn out pretty clean first drafts? Uh, what's that editing process like? I'm more on the clean side of things. I tried um, the, oh my goodness, what is her name? Uh, Anne Lamott yeah. method of, you know, write, write a crappy first bird. draft. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that doesn't work for me. I know it works for some people, but for me, if I just, you know, scramble it all out, I just throw it on the page. I've tried this at least twice before and the story just doesn't come together. And so I end up rewriting the entire book in a different way. And it's not only a waste of time, the story doesn't feel as authentic for me. I think for other people it works, but for me, I want to get it as close to the final product as possible, even if it takes a little longer for each chapter. So, which is not to say I don't have major edits, you know, for woman last scene, the middle of the book, Maggie goes to Rome to, it really sets her on her journey of self-discovery and redefining her life. And in the first draft that wasn't in there, there was no um, no catalyst, and my developmental editor was like, I think you're missing something here. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I really am. Uh, and, you know, it made sense on the second draft. I knew how to fix it. But, um, yeah, it doesn't always work out perfectly, but I, I do like to get it right that first time around. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you've learned about that, uh, that middle part of the book? Uh, because, you know, a, a lot of times um, – the, the beginning of the book is super easy to write. You, you, the characters mm-hmm. are fresh and the situations are fresh and, and you know, they're, they're usually really dynamite coming out. And then a, a lot of times we have an idea of how it's going to end and we, we wind up kind of writing toward that. Um, but that mm-hmm. mush, that mushy middle is, uh, is problematic for a lot of people. Um, it, it, oh, is right. there anything that you've learned about getting through that middle part and, and keeping the reader engaged? Well, the the middle is the misery of my existence. (laughs) I hate the middle. (laughs) But I'm getting better. And something, um, I just read this screenwriting book called Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. And screenwriters know it well, but I really think every novelist should read it too, because there are so much in there about keeping the middle interesting that I wish I had known earlier in my career about just keeping the action going. Of course, there are a lot of writing books out there that, that talk about this. Um, uh, Story Genius, Donald Mass's books, like, you know, there's a lot out there, but this screenwriting book in particular just gives you little tiny techniques that are not gimmicky. They're just, they'll work for any story. And so I used some of that on my fifth book that I just finished. Uh, Camille, what do you hope people take away from, woman last seen in her 30s? I think like all of my novels, it's really a book about making the most of life and whatever that throws at you. It took me a bunch of books to figure out that that's what I write about, but it really is um, taking your circumstances and living fully every day, which is hard to do. And I think this is another book that talks about that. 
Um, the book, uh, when this airs, uh, is available everywhere uh, for people to pick up a copy of, and we're going to send everybody to get a, a copy of Blessing or 30s. Um, Camille, where can people uh, find you online if they want to learn more about your writing and, and follow you along this journey? The best place is CamillePagan.com. Um, you can see all my various social media links there and read a little more about my journalism, and all of my books are on there as well. Excellent. Uh, Camille, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Hank. It was so fun. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Summer waned. The sun still kissed the waters of the Hudson, but less passionately like a bride having second thoughts. The days grew a minute shorter, the shadows a millimeter longer, and fear descended upon Sleepy Hollow just as imperceptibly. Even in the heat of July, when the town still wore shorts and sandals, when it still carried ice chests and pressed beers to its forehead, when its children played in sand piles and its old men sat talking baseball, bad things began to happen. Everywhere, it seemed. On the afternoon of July 10th, two Terrytown women went shopping at the barn's stationery store. Both reached for the last package of lace wedding invitations at the same time. Their confrontation ended with bloody fists and an ambulance ride. On July 14th, Larry Putnam choked on a California spring roll at Andy Ng's Japanese sushi restaurant on Beekman Avenue. The following Saturday, Judy Jessup found Gypsy her daughter's black cat, dead, strung up on the fence behind their house, just dangling there, eyes open and fangs bared. Come sunset, fireflies hung thick above the lawns of the hollow. Red eyes peered through the shutters of abandoned houses. A mist rose from the parched earth and hung low, especially behind the old Dutch church, among the graves of the ancient burying ground. The old Croton Aqueduct Trail, usually a summer playground, grew eerily empty. Hardly anyone walked there, especially at night, when gnarled branches held hands and rustled to each other around cauldron clearings of moonlight. Those who did so reported strange attacks, gossamer apparitions, and the distant sound of horses' hooves. Eleven years prior, after the GM plant had closed, when the village of North Terrytown had been rechristened Sleepy Hollow, it had seemed natural to adopt the horseman as town mascot. He appeared on the badges of the police officers, on the sides of the fire trucks, on the menus of restaurants, on the stationery of the mayor. He arose from his grave as a tchotchke in the gift shops. He haunted the helmets of the football team, the windows of the bike shop, the rings presented to outgoing seniors. The black-cloaked figure of the headless horseman manifested everywhere ubiquitous as Mickey Mouse in the Magic Kingdom, and almost as subliminal. People had grown used to the horseman, fond of him even. Eventually they had ceased to notice him. They noticed him now. And they noticed him everywhere. On hats and collar pins and park signs, on cars and buses, on statues, on plaques, on the side of the chevron. The horseman galloped down Beekman Avenue, shop window by shop window. He rode in daylight and in darkness and in the nightmares of their children. Their fondness for the figure became fear, dread, and doubt. Why had they named their town after a ghost story? To name a thing is to give it power, to give it substance and flesh. What had they done? Each sunset, as the village of Sleepy Hollow sank deeper into shadow, more and more former North Terrytowners wondered if embracing the legend hadn't been a mistake. But they had to press forward. The mill wheel turns. Summer ends. Time comes for school to start. The ball glove goes into the closet. Grandfather asks for a jacket. Beer becomes coffee or pumpkin spice. A leaf turns, falls, and twists. The season comes. There's money to be made. Time to unpack the fright masks 
to fetch the scarecrow from his firehouse closet. Time to bundle the corn stalks and light the pumpkins. Time for the headless horseman to menace the tourists again.